So I've talked slightly glibly about fitting, but what even does that mean? Well, trivially, it means finding the best parameters for your model. But how do you find them? And for that matter, what do we mean by best? Let's take that second question first and introduce the concept of a loss function. Loss functions are really the heart of machine learning. They're the thing that allows it to work at all. These are functions that we choose or define that tell us how good our model is, or more usually, how bad. They provide a measure of badness of the model, and in particular, they provide a measure of badness that we have some way of optimising. So we specifically choose them with that in mind. Usually what this means, although not always, is that they are differentiable. We will usually denote loss functions with the letter L, and so they might look something like this. Although some people prefer to use a J or any number of other notations. And the arguments given to the loss function may vary significantly depending on the context. An important thing about loss functions is that in most cases they are just a proxy for the task that we really want to perform. They are a means to an end, but rather than an end in themselves. As a reasonable first approximation, nobody cares about the value of your loss function. What we care about are things like classification accuracy rather than categorical cross-entropy. We care about image quality rather than mean squared error. We care about audio fidelity rather than spectral losses. In most cases, the exact values of the losses have no real meaning. They only acquire meaning because of their relative values. So it's important that one is bigger than another, but the actual values are rarely important. There are a few edge cases which do have uh, significant interpretations. There are a few values for some losses, like zero, or in some cases one, or possibly infinity, where you can actually say something useful about what that means in terms of the task. But in most cases, they are just a kind of secondary thing that we need to use, but they don't necessarily perfectly capture that task. A loss function will often have two or more components representing different properties that we are looking to trade off in the solution to our problem. We'll start seeing some examples of that as early as next week. It is possible to define very complicated loss functions that have many, many components capturing all the nuances of a complicated problem space, but quite a lot of problems can be solved using just a handful of relatively simple loss metrics. In particular, for problems where it makes sense, the familiar Euclidean distance, or L2 norm, is often a good starting point, partly because it has a very intuitive geometric interpretation. It literally tells us how far we are away from our solution. So we have a loss function which tells us how bad our model is. Where do we go from here? We want to find a parameter set which we'll call theta star, where the star just indicates that it's the best. We want to find this set such that the loss function is as low as it possibly can be. There's a handy bit of notation for this called argmin, which looks like this. And what this means is find the value of theta, the theta being underneath the argmin means that that what we're minimizing with respect to, find the value of theta such that the output of the rest of the function is as low as possible. There's a corresponding function argmax, which means exactly what you think it does. This is a way of writing down what we want to do, but it doesn't tell us 
how to do it. And in general, the problem may be extremely difficult or even impossible to solve. However, we will usually have chosen our loss function with the intent that it be possible to minimize it. And so let's assume that the problem isn't completely intractable. There are at least five ways in which we might attempt to solve this problem. We can attempt to find an analytic solution by finding the roots of the derivative of the loss function with respect to theta. We can attempt to find a numeric solution by following the gradient or subgradients of the loss function with respect to theta. We can perform an exhaustive search of all available values of theta. We can perform a non-exhaustive search that is in some way systematic. Or we could just try values at random. Let's take these one by one. We're looking for the values of theta that give us the minimum loss. That is to say, the minimum of the loss function. You'll recall from basic calculus that the derivatives of a function are zero at its extrema, that is to say, at the minimum and maximum points. If we use this notation to denote the gradient of the loss function with respect to the parameters theta, it is occasionally possible to formulate and solve this equation, in which case we're laughing. The values of theta, for which this is true, must be the minimum values of the loss function. There are some other criteria that have to be met as well, but for the time being, let's just assume that that's always the case. In practice, it's very rare that we can solve this analytically. We'll look at a couple of cases next week, and then that's pretty much it. And so we have to find a different approach. If the loss function is differentiable with respect to the parameters, then even if there is no analytic solution for finding the minimum, we will often be able to find it incrementally, numerically, by looking at the gradient. So if you're at any point on a function and you're not already at the minimum, then the minimum must be below you, and to get to it, then you, at least in a local sense, want to be walking downhill. If you take a small step downhill and look at the gradient again and you keep doing that, then eventually you should find your way to at least a minimum point of the function. This method, known as gradient descent and a number of variations of it, are really the workhorse of a lot of machine learning and especially of deep learning and we'll look at that in more detail in the weeks to come. One of the things about gradient descent is that because it only uses local information about the gradient, it can get stuck in local minima if there are any. An important class of functions are functions that have no local minima, only a single global minimum. These are known as convex functions. Convex functions are very desirable if you can manage to find a, a convex loss function because it means you have no risk of getting stuck in a local minimum and gradient descent is almost guaranteed to take you to or very close to the minimum point. One thing to note is that the opposite of a convex function is a non-convex function. It isn't a concave function. Concave functions are actually very similar to convex functions. They're just the other way up. So a convex function has only a single global minimum. A concave function has only a single global maximum. And you can always turn one into the other just by negating. Convex loss functions are obviously very nice because they're much more consistently optimizable. And in fact, convex optimization is a whole important field of its own. 
and there are reliable and mature software tools available for optimizing a variety of classes of convex problems. These have names like linear programming and quadratic programming. And although we're not going to go into details on these here, uh, they are important for optimizing a number of kinds of machine learning model. Uh, because convexity is a nice property for a loss function, I will point out when we have a convex loss function, but it's worth bearing in mind that for certain important classes of machine learning models, the loss functions are massively non-convex. If there are only a finite number of possible values that your parameters can take on, it may be possible to search them all. In that case, you are guaranteed to find the right answer. This may be prohibitively expensive, and obviously there are cases where it doesn't apply at all. But actually, even for continuous parameters, it's sometimes possible to use a brute force search, because even though you can't test all of the possible values in an infinite set, it may well be that the only ones that you need to test are ones that actually crop up in your training data, and there will always be only a finite number of those. If an exhaustive search of the parameter space is too costly, we might be able to divide up that space in some systematic way into smaller pieces that make the search more tractable. Probably the simplest and most intuitive way of doing that is a grid search where you divide up each of the dimensions into regular intervals and search all of those individual combinations. This can work quite well, but it scales extremely badly with the dimensionality of the space. One way that you can partly uh, counter this is by using a recursive search, where you search only very, very coarsely at a uh, first pass, find the best region of space at that coarse search, search that in slightly finer detail, and keep doing that repeatedly until you narrow in on the best range. This will occasionally produce good answers. It can, however, take you in completely the wrong direction if your function is not fairly nicely behaved. Recursive grid search is an example of a more general class of algorithms, known as greedy algorithms, which divide the search up into a series of steps, solve the steps one at a time, and fix those answers, never revisiting them later in the light of new information. Greedy algorithms can be very effective and good at stemming the tide of enormous combinatorial explosions. But if the early stages turn out to be wrong, you'll be increasingly led towards the wrong answer. So they depend, again, on the parameter space and the function being well behaved. Finally, we get to the trying values at random approach a random search obviously sounds a bit bizarre, but it's not quite as crazy as it sounds. In some cases, it can achieve a more efficient sampling of the parameter space, especially when some dimensions are significantly more important than others. The reason for this is that with a random search, you are effectively sampling all of the different dimensions independently, which means that you wind up doing lots of more different values on each one. If some of the dimensions are extremely unimportant, then doing something like a grid search, for example, will waste an awful lot of time testing, though, testing different values of the parameters that don't matter, and that's wasting a lot of your sampling budget that could be spent on more relevant dimensions. With a random search, you don't have that problem because you're randomly searching each, dim each dimension separately. Random search approaches are particularly relevant for ensemble methods where you're generating multiple models, getting the results from all of them and aggregating them, say by averaging or voting. Random searches, of course, have really terrible worst case performance, so if you're very unlucky, 
then the results will be catastrophically bad. Fitting a model involves making choices, choice of which model to fit and what learning algorithm to fit with, and possibly also details specific to the model. Things like how many clusters to use in your k-means clustering, or how many neighbours in your nearest neighbours algorithm, how many neurons in a neural net, how many trees in a random forest, what is your learning rate. These are not parameters of the model, they're parameters of the process by which the model is created, and we call them hyperparameters. Crucially, they're not learned as part of the learning algorithm. You have to set them by some other means. And if you get them wrong, it can mean the difference between the model working well and not working at all. So for this reason, having lots of hyperparameters is often considered a disadvantage when weighing up the pros and cons of different models and algorithms. Summing up then, Fitting means finding the best model parameters, and it's quantified by a loss function. The loss function stands in as a proxy for the real task that we want to achieve. The optimum values are found by one or another optimization algorithm, and that's how you fit a model. Most of machine learning boils down to this. Of course, the devil is in the details. <laughs>